All right, so good morning, everybody. Uh, we're gonna give a quick run through here on uh, Dupatron's disease. Disclosures, uh, the university gets a royalty from BTC because of our invention of uh, collagenase. Uh, Dupatron's disease uh, is called Dupatron's disease because I'm sure Dupatron's performed the first uh, fasciectomy in 1831. Uh, but he wasn't the first to look at this disease. It's noted in writings from Orkney and Iceland in the 12th and 13th century. And uh, Flack, uh, Felix Plattner from Basel described it in 1614. John Hunter, who was a, par a, a member of the British Royal College of Surgeons, did dissections in 1777, the year of Dupatron's birth, and described this uh, accurately. Uh, if we look at Dupatron's disease, we start by noticing that the skin on the dorsum of our hand is loose and flexible. The skin on the bottom is attached by ligaments uh, that run longitudinally, transversely, and vertically, so that as we grab objects, we're not scooting around on our hands. Uh, the main uh, fibrocytes in the fascia of the normal ligaments turn into myofibroblasts. This is the main cell in this disorder. It produces abnormal amounts of type three collagen. The myofibroblasts cause these normal ligaments to thicken and ultimately shorten and produce the contractors that we see clinically. Genetic plays a role. Uh, injury can make contractures worse, but it probably doesn't cause the contracture, although this has been debated for a century. And when you start to understand this disorder, you need to start by understanding the normal and abnormal ligaments. The involved normal structures are the Grayson's ligament and the lateral sheath in the digit, the natatory ligament in the web, the pretendinous band in the palm, and the spiral bands uh, at, in your, the MP joint. Uninvolved structures, or typically uninvolved, are Cleland's ligaments, which are dorsal to the neurovascular bundles, and the superficial transverse ligaments of Skoog in the palm. Uh, here we see the normal ligaments again depicted. Note their relationships to the neurovascular bundle, uh, the, the uh, tendon structures, and bone. Here are the typical abnormal structures that develop as the ligaments change into uh, cords. The central cord is the classic one going right up the middle. Uh, the lateral cord, the natatory cord in the web, the pretendinous cord really becomes part of the central cord, and the famous spiral cord, which we'll go into more detail. The spiral cord really spirals the neurovascular bundle more than it spirals itself. Uh, it occurs, as you see here in the image on the left, just at the uh, level of the MP joint and proximal phalanx. Uh, it can position the nerve essentially right under the skin. So if you're doing a surgical exposure here, you may go through the skin and then cut the nerve. So you must proceed very carefully in this area. And the best way to deal with this is start dissections proximally and follow the nerve out and cut the skin after you have a sense of where the nerve is underneath it. Uh, the genetics have always been thought to be fairly straightforward as an autosomal dominant Mendelian inheritance pattern with variable penetrance. Uh, recent studies have shown that this is uh, much more complicated. We are involved with the international study looking at uh, the genome and there are nine loci involved and six of these have to do with the wind pathway uh, which is, has a serious uh, predictor of fibromatosis and Dupatron's disease. The incidence uh, in a Norwegian study from many years ago showed that 9% of the males had it, 3% of the females. A more recent study done by Auxilium in the United States showed a 1% to 3% incidence in Caucasians. It is pretty common in Caucasians, but it is present essentially everywhere. Associated diseases are uh, epilepsy, alcoholism, uh, diabetes, AIDS, etc. Uh, there's not a cause and effect relationship in these situations. It's simply that if you look at a population of alcoholics, say the incidence of Dupatron's is higher than the normal incidence in patients without this disorder. Uh, we don't know why these uh, relationships exist. Dupatron's disease starts out in the palm as a little nodule near the distal palmar crease, which they're outlined here in red dots. The nodules may be mildly, mildly painful in the beginning uh, and very small. They can enlarge. They kind of look like calluses, but they're not. They're underneath the skin in the subcutaneous tissue. Often the pain of this can resolve 
Uh, so going after them initially because they hurt is not appropriate. Uh, occasionally, very occasionally, a nodule will regress and not turn into a Dupuytren's cord. Ectopic fibromatoses exist uh, in other locations. The classic ones are the foot, where we have plantar fibromatosis, uh, penile fibromatosis, or Peyronie's disease, or knuckle pads, as seen here in the image. Uh, the plantar fibromatoses occur in the arch, and as you see here in the uh, image, uh, they can become painful as they get large and push on the structures of the foot while walking. Uh, it is a difficult problem to fix surgically because if you cut the honeycomb fibrous fatty cushion we walk on surgically, sometimes pain is worse after removing these than before. An interesting occasional presentation of Dupatrons are these little nodules at the distal end of the palmaris longus, and uh, they can sometimes be the only thing present in the beginning. The nodule enlarge changes the longitudinal ligament into a cord. The cord is not a tendon. The cord is under the skin and superficial to the flexor tendons. The cord thickens, shortens, and pulls the finger into the classic flexion contracture. The fourth and fifth digits are more commonly involved. The thumb, index, and long less so, but, but definitely have the disease in them uh, in certain patients. The web and the thumb are also involved occasionally. Uh, the cord patterns pretty, uh, predetermined the, or are predetermined by the ligaments that they originate from. Uh, John Houston noted the severity of Dupuytren's disease was worse in those individuals with a family history, those who started at a young age, and those who had ectopic uh, fibromatoses in other locations. He called this the Dupuytren's diathesis. Uh, this uh, particular subset of the population with Dupuytren's disease is often tested on training exams. Remember, as we deal with this, we care for patients because they have complaints related to the problem, not just the presence of the problem. So there are symptoms to think about and ask about, uh, such as poking yourself in the eye when you're trying to wash your face, you can't get your hand into pocket or other small places. And of course, importantly, in the Irish population who have this rapidly is you can't hold your beer. Uh, the tabletop test was invented by John Houston. Basically, it's very simple. If the contracted fingers uh, cannot extend enough to place the fingers and palm on the flat surface at the same time, then you have enough Dupuytren's disease to think about therapeutic intervention. John used this because he worked in Australia and people sometimes came hundreds of miles to see him and he wanted them to only come when they needed to. So he taught the patient how to do the test for themselves. Surgical indications are uh, contractures that are of a certain degree because at that point we feel they're going to get worse. MP contractures, I usually look at 20 to 30 degrees uh, before I say therapeutic intervention is appropriate. Uh, PIP contractures, 20 degrees and evidence that they're progressing. Uh, it used to be written that any contracture of the PIP was a surgical indication. The difficulty I found with that is I'd see particularly some women where they have a 10 degree contracture, they're concerned what was wrong, but had no real symptoms. And with following him, they never got worse. So it didn't seem appropriate to operate on them unless it started to progress. Uh, the management surgically has been studied by McFarland in a multi-center international study, which a long time ago we were involved with, 1200 patients. The key thing to note here is 20% or so did really well, 60% uh, or so improved but some surgical patients were the same or worse uh, after a surgical intervention. So surgery works, but it's not uh, given that you will have no problems. The surgical incisions for Dupuytren's disease uh, are a huge number of them. Uh, here you just see some of them that I found in the literature. Uh, the thing to note here really is follow the basic plans that you should, but no, soup, no skin incision is going to uh, make a perfect surgical outcome. The standard current incisions that are typically used today are the uh, zigzag uh, incision you see in A and B, uh, a longitudinal incision which is later turned into a zigzag by Z-plasty, or transverse incisions which were popularized by McCash. Here is a patient, 49-year-old male with a seven-year hi history of Dupuytrons involving the long and ring finger, Englishman, uh, and a smoker. So we've used a longitudinal incision in, in the palm out to the distal palmar crease and then zigzag into the fingers. 
you'll notice that the incision was made in the proximal part and not extended into the fingers right away. I have found that if you uh, ex extend the finger, what you started to draw as a definite zigzag incision becomes a longitudinal incision if you uh, don't release the proximal part of the cord first before defining the incision pattern in the digit. Uh, here you see exposure of the central cords in the two digits, the interconnecting Skoog's ligaments, and uh, the dissection that's necessary to do that. The distally based web flap will survive nicely. You do not flip it back dorsally, obviously. You just mobilize it enough to see the neurovascular bundles and the cords. Uh, here is a close up again, and also a look at the trans, uh, the cross sectional uh, images at approximately the MP joint and more approximately at the superficial arch. The key thing to note is that the uh, the cord is sitting over the flexor tendons distally, but as you move proximally, they coalesce and come together uh, and are over the neurovascular bundle as well as the flexor tendons. In dissecting these, I usually start proximally and separate the two cords from each other proximally and then take one out at a time. Uh, here you see some images of surgical dissections, uh, noting the digital nerve, noting the flexor tendon, uh, the cord, and the excised cord. Uh, here in this image, you see the transverse uh, ligaments of Skoog. The, cl the clamp is protecting the underlying neurovascular bundles as these are cut. Uh, some people advocate leaving the transverse carpal ligaments intact. I always find that uh, releasing the transverse carpal ligament and seeing the neurovascular bundle and following the ner nerve, particularly uh, distally, uh, is important to the safety of the nerves and arteries, and therefore I'd like to open these ligaments. Uh, the spiral cord, as we mentioned, uh, another very testable topic. Uh, as the cord gets wrapped around the neurovascular bundle, uh, the cord basically ends up straight, but the neurovascular bundle spirals, but we call it a spiral cord. The spiral cord problem moves the nerve proximal, superficial, and centrally. And again, it's right under the skin when you open the skin. Uh, this is not easy to identify uh, preoperatively. The only way I've seen to have a chance of doing this that's accurate is to use a uh, Doppler and map out the artery. Here you see a uh, surgical case with the cartoons showing the cord location and the neurovascular or the nerve locations and then the flexor tendons location. Uh, also involved are the natatory ligaments and these are in the web. Uh, the nerves can be under them, over them, uh, or sometimes the disease is on both sides. The PIP contracture is a particularly troublesome part of Dupuytren's disease. In the uh, college age population I've looked at, 66% of the patients had some part of a PIP contracture. Most of the time, it was in combination with an MP contracture. Uh, it is present uh, more commonly in the little finger and less so in the long finger. Other conditions to think about that affect your capacity to get a straight PIP joint are, one, the joint can be arthritic, Two, the central slip and extensor hood may attenuate because the joint has been in severe flexion for often years. Uh, the lateral bands can sublux volar and uh, therefore become a contracting element. The collaterals contract, the volar plate contracts, and even the flexor tendon sheath uh, can get tight. Uh, I once had cut surgically everything uh, to the point that the finger would dislocate at the PIP joint but as soon as it was located, it was still fixed in flexion and it was the lateral bands which then had to be released. When operating in the fifth finger, understand that there is essentially two digital nerves here. One is the real digital nerve, which is a juxtaposition to the digital artery and often spirals around the so-called abductor digit minimi cord. And there's the dorsal ulnar sensory nerve. At the base of the proximal phalanx, the digital nerve is about three fascicles and the dorsal nerve is two fascicles. So you want to be careful not to injure it because of sensory loss to the ulnar side of the hand and also to avoid neuroma pain. Here we see in the digit loosening Grayson's ligaments uh, to expose the neurovascular bundle and identify its location before excising the cord. Uh, here in the uh, image on the left, you'll see 
the neurovascular bundle, the cord, abductor digiminimi cord, and the dorsal nerve. On the right, you see surgical exposure of the nerve and the radial lateral cord. When you finish surgery, it is appropriate to let the tourniquet down, uh, make sure you control bleeding uh, and identify the vascularity of your flaps. If you look at everything very quickly as the tourniquet is going down, you can usually see the capillary film branch back into the flap nicely. When you go to control hemostasis, be very careful, use a bipolar cautery. Understand the nerve, the artery rather is very small. It's easy to zap it if you're not careful. In general, bleeding can be controlled by a little bit of gentle pressure uh, after a tourniquet is released. Uh, the McCash technique is particularly useful when you would otherwise need skin grafts. Uh, these transverse incisions can be left open in a patient with uh, arthritis that has difficulty with stiffness in the digit unrelated to the Dupatrons. You immediately set them out on soaks and exercises and uh, flexing in the, uh, in the, uh, in the soaking. Uh, it was originally written that these incisions heal in a few a week or two. It's more like a month or two. Uh, but they do work and large openings will close and give uh, excellent appearing uh, healed wounds and allow the patient to move appropriately while they're rehabilitating. Uh, the thumb is involved in two areas. One is the commissural cord seen there on the left and the radial cord uh, going up the thumb longitudinally radial to the flexor tendon. The x-ray shows a wire placed on the cord so you see the relationship of the cords to the skeleton. Uh, the, the drawing shows uh, targets for collagenase injection uh, when dealing with this particular cord in the thumb. Here's a surgical one. Uh, you'll see the uh, radial cord and the more trans, or in this image, vertical uh, line uh, going along the path of the commissural cord and the excised specimen. Skin grafting is a useful tool. Uh, sometimes, particularly in recurrent cases, the skin has been damaged so much and the disease is in the skin that you must excise skin and then replace it with uh, partial thickness uh, skin grafts. You see one going here in the thumb and an older one present in the palm. This individual had disease in all five digits of both hands. It was felt that skin grafting prevented recurrence it does retard recurrence, but it doesn't prevent it completely. Uh, one of my colleagues from London had an excellent um, picture of a giant recurrent cord under a beautiful big skin graft. The, the knuckle pad, uh, for the most part, you leave it alone. Uh, the knuckle pad uh, is a sign of Dupatron, sometimes the presenting sign. They're often sore when they first appear, just like nodules, but the, usually the pain goes away. If they get really big or become extremely painful and the patient is uh, terrified that it's cancer, excising them can be done. The thing to note is that there is no plane between the uh, extensor hood and the nodule. You have to dissect this surgically and sharply. And if you damage the hood where the X is in the right image, you will end up with a boutonniere. Uh, the closed uh, fasciotomy was used in the uh, 50s and after World War II. Simply jab a knife in there and cut it in the office. Uh, the trouble with this is it cut neurovascular bundles and tendons and was felt to be not a good program. Uh, later on, the French came up with the needle aponeurotomy, which is very useful in uh, the appropriate patients and particularly for MP contractures. Uh, I personally don't use it, but a lot of my colleagues do use it successfully. Recurrence is uh, present with that, pro that approach to therapy as, as it is with all the others. Steroids were thought to be helpful. Then Ketchum from Kansas uh, reported using it successfully, but then reported later that they all returned. Uh, there was a French report of good results, uh, and another fellow tried it on his own, as, as did Houston, and it didn't work. Uh, it does seem to make sense because it reduces the expression of VCAM1, uh, but uh, it doesn't seem to really work clinically. When you have a situation that isn't corrected by joint release and fasciectomy, uh, some salvage procedures include arthrodesis of the PIP joint, uh, a PIP prosthesis, or an amputation. I've done the arthrodesis successfully in cases with uh, recurrence times two or three or four, Prosthesis I have not used and amputation I've only had to do once. 
Uh, complications with surgery include hematoma, infection, skin loss, tendon damage, tendon uh, uh, breaking, um, nerve injury, vascular damage, digital ischemia, need for amputation, and complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, this is often a straightforward procedure, but it can be an extremely complex, difficult uh, procedure, and you have to understand uh, the potential problems before tackling each one and look at each case separately. Outcomes that were studied by Strickland and others, uh, they found that if the initial PIP uh, contracture was less than 30, often the correction was maintained. If it was 30 to 60, 20% or so got better. After 60, some of them ended up worse. The assumption that you can release the volar plate and the collateral ligaments and do the fasciectomy and correct the PIP contracture forever is not correct in many patients. Uh, in um, September of 2009, uh, we brought collagenase uh, forward as a possible therapeutic option for this. Uh, we started working this in 1991. It was approved by the FDA in 2010. Here you see the injection in the cartoon. Dr. Hurst is going to break the cord. There you go. And a, a manipulation maneuver to break the cord. And one of the yes, cool well, thing uh, is you have immediate active range anything? of motion. Great. When dealing with the uh, collagenase, you're going to use a hubless syringe with a 27 gauge needle. You must understand the beginning of the cord where it bow strings away from the flexor tendon because that's the place where it's the safest. Uh, you're going to palpate the cord on tension to define where the medication should be placed. Again, placing in the area of bowstring is the safest. And you're going to palpate the cord to build a mental, mental image of exactly where the cord is located. Uh, typically, the uh, dose given into the cord is 0.58 milligrams at the level of the MP joint. It's diluted a little bit more than at the PIP joint. Uh, I often now divide the dose into three to six aliquots uh, to place it in the appropriate spots. Uh, the needle needs to go through the dorsal edge of the cord. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, if the needle goes through the dorsal edge of the cord, take it out and put it back in again. You don't want to shoot the medication into the fat under the cord. You want to shoot it into the cord. When doing this, you put the needle in place then you uh, stabilize the plunger so that as you advance the, I'm um, sorry, you stabilize the barrel. So as you advance the plunger, you don't advance the needle and again, put the drug in the wrong place. Another helpful hint is to have the cord on tension by the nurse uh, extending the finger uh, passively while you're doing this. For the manipulation, 90% uh, of my cases uh, or all of them really have a local block for manipulation. Uh, occasionally with patients with pacemakers or whatever, uh, they're also at uh, the AMP surgery center where they're being monitored and get some sedation. The manipulation procedure, you uh, first uh, flex the PIP and extend the MP, then flex the MP, extend the PIP, extend both joints with the finger extended, push on the cord and break it up. And then another step is to ab and adduct the uh, finger to, to break any uh, natatory uh, ligament uh, cord components. Uh, my experience now is about 4,000. Uh, only about 2,000 of the patients I see with this diagnosis warrant treatment. Uh, a good half of them, as you see, are just nodules and all they need is reassurance of what's going on and what to watch for. 46% uh, were treated with colleges, still treating some with surgery. The age, uh, age range and the breakdown male and female is shown. Uh, surgical indications, nodule excision only, again, only if it is painful, larging, and, and you're concerned of the diagnosis. If you have to release a trigger finger and you're going to dissect through a nodule, take it out. The surgical insult of the nodule will often aggravate it and turn it into a cord. Uh, fasciectomy for the palm and digits is still done, sometimes still need skin graft, particularly in cases that are recurred after previous surgery in the base of the fifth finger, the flaps die and you can get the cord to pop with collagenase, but the hole in the skin that occurs because the skin is deficient, then heals and drags the finger back into flexion. Fasciectomy can be done with carpal tunnel. It was seen for many years that this was not appropriate, uh, but it's now felt to be uh, safe. 
Occasionally, a digit widget can be used to help extend a stiff PIP joint after disrupting the cord, either with collagenase or surgery. Um, fasciectomy and my hands have been done for multiple digits, uh, some recurrence post uh, collagenase and recurrence post surgery. Uh, a majority of the recurrences I have dealt with, I've just repeated the collagenase. Uh, just to show a quick some examples, uh, here is a, a patient with a large cord to the finger, central cord. Here's the so-called Y cord, which is a connect, a uh, coalescence of a central cord and an auditory cord, uh, sort of a crowfoot's cord where there's a central cord and then two auditory cords, one going to the, each of the adjacent fingers, the contracture of the web. And you will also see a small percentage of very complex cords which uh, do not follow the typical patterns we usually see. Here is a 69-year-old male with the central cord to the ring finger. Uh, here's what it looks like if you're watching carefully. Uh, palpate it so you get an image in your mind of what it looks like underneath the skin. Define in your head where you're going to put the injections. Right, and here you are two weeks later after manipulation. Okay. One more time. Open real hard for me. After uh, treatment, surgical or otherwise, splinting is appropriate. Uh, standard extension planning, splinting for night, reverse knuckle benders for stiff uh, PIP joints. And as I mentioned earlier, occasionally the use of a uh, digit widget uh, to stretch out a PIP joint. This does work, but it doesn't prevent 100% uh, the recurrence. In my hands, the improvement with MP contracture with collagenase has been reasonable at 40 degrees and 90% improvement. As you would expect, PIPs do worse, but still get meaningful improvement. Uh, complications do occur with collagenase. Small skin tears uh, are the, one of the most common, um, usually resolve in two to four weeks, and they do not need surgical intervention, at least in my hands. Other side effects, almost everybody gets some ecchymosis, a good portion gets some itching. Sometimes the lymph nodes at the elbow or axilla swell up, but this goes away. Uh, I have seen no severe allergic reactions. There's been one reported in a patient that was done in an office who was already on nasal oxygen. Not sure why anyone would do that. Um, I haven't seen any permanent nerve or vessel injuries. Tendon injuries have happened. In our major study, there were three in 1,082 patients or 2,600 injections. Uh, usually we stop anticoagulants before giving collagenase. In a patient who couldn't stop, uh, we did her anyway. You see the picture there, three days post-injection. Looks pretty scary. Three weeks later, it's resolved. Uh, but the FDA approval says stop the major anticoagulants before injecting. You do not have to stop aspirin. Recurrence is a problem. Uh, 40%, 47% get some worsening at five years. And you see the other data related to recurrence here. I think some of the major things you should think about are these Dupatron's rules. The first thing I tell every patient is we cannot cure this. The other thing to keep in mind is this is a benign condition. This is not cancer, it's not fatal. If you have a minimal contracture that isn't progressing you've got to ask about symptoms and decide whether surgical recommendation is appropriate. Recurrence happens. In my experience, it's not predictable who's going to recur. Keep in mind, patients want to avoid surgery if they can. Also keep in mind, particularly uh, in earlier uh, decades when we did only surgery, it's one thing to have an unhappy patient who cannot extend their fingers. It's another thing to have an unhappy patient who can now not make a fist. And that was a occurring complication of surgical cases, particularly in the past. Also remember the rusty PIP joint is a problem that is not fixed by removing the cord and surgically is often not fixed by releasing the molar plate or the collateral ligaments. Uh, I try to approach this with patients that were managing a problem that may well go on for a lifetime. It's not a one and done in many patients, unfortunately. Here are some textbooks that you can use for references. Our website at handsurgeryresource.org has a whole section on uh, Dupatrons as well as all the other topics we're covering today. Uh, thank you for your attention.